Guys, I think we're back. We're back. And totally. this is our this is our first hotcakes in quite a it's long time. Thank you guys. Two stacks. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> Wouldn't it be three stacks? It's been like three months. I did realize that this is an important show. Uh, selfishly, this is an important show for me because kind of trying to go through the primary literature like this and come up with like takeaways is is a challenging thing. And, uh, you know, a lot of the time I'm just lazy and I just read like, you know, the, yeah, the stuff that's sent to my inbox where someone's already done all that for me. But it is good to practice it and doing this it on my own. This is very much the, the dentist's office visit of my curbsiders experience. Like I, I dread it for weeks. <laughs> um, I hate doing it. And then when we're done, I'm glad that it's over, but also glad that we did it. So <laughs> take do you do it with will. conscious sedation? <laughs> the Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For more, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash back more hospital and affiliate outreach programs. If indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible. If you screw up, you should always do your own homework and let us know what we're wrong. <laughs> I thought this was a really fun episode, and I I liked all the all three articles yeah. that we talked about a lot. Chris, you should, we should probably tell them what's coming up on the episode. Well, welcome back, guys. This is our first uh, hot cakes and hot takes of 2019. I'm happy to bring you the recent research articles and news coverage that grab the curbsiders' attention. We have Armin Gottlieb of the online publication The Scope joining us to discuss topics including the ever controversial e-cigarette smoking cessation question. Outcomes related to antibiotic treatment of UTIs among elderly adults, very controversial. And the role of subcontrol, I know I killed that, Valsartan for acute decompensated heart failure in the, in, in, in the inpatient setting, also known as the Pioneer HF study. I hope you guys enjoy the episode. So uh, with us tonight is our esteemed guest, Armand. Armand, I, before we start getting into the articles, I need you to give the audience a one-liner about yourself and then tell us a little bit about your, your esteemed organization. So yeah, my name is Armin Gottlieb. I am a third year internal medicine resident at Columbia University Medical Center in New York City. I'm a co-editor of a publication called The Scope, which is a free and brief weekly roundup of the recent medical literature. Um, it's curated by residents and for residents. Um, we try our best to find the most important and most useful articles uh, for inpatient and outpatient medicine and present them in an entertaining and memorable way. Um, you can sign up at www.medicinescope.com. Yeah, it, it convinced me. I signed up five minutes ago. <laughs> Armand, if you don't mind, can you just tell us really quickly how you got involved with the scope? Uh, yeah. So uh, when I was a, a medical student, I found it very overwhelming um, and very impressive with how all the residents and attendings knew all this literature. I had no idea how you accumulated all this all this knowledge and information. And as an intern, I found it equally daunting. And as an intern at uh, my hospital, my branch of Cashlock Hospital, uh, we are all immediately signed up for the scope because it comes out of uh, residents at our program. Um, and so it was a quick, takes like three, four minutes to read. It was a thing I got in my email box every week. And Pretty, com pretty commonly, there were issues that would come up on rounds, issues that would come up when I was in clinic, um, and, and help me make better clinical decisions and, and look a little less stupid than I actually am on rounds in front of my attendings and senior residents. Um, so I really enjoyed it. And then as a second year, I started writing for, writing for it every week, which I found to be a really nice creative outlet as a resident where um, residency can be very overwhelming and all-consuming, and you're sort of just trying to stay afloat. And it gave me an hour a week to both stay up with the literature, but also have a creative of outlet to try to figure out how to take these articles, figure out which ones are most important and, and write them in a funny, uh, brief way that I thought my colleagues uh, might find entertaining and palatable. So now that you know the secret, which is finding a subscription service that will tell you what's important to read, how do you pick the articles for the scope? Like, where are you getting your, how are you making your decisions? Yeah. So, um, there's like four of us that are pretty involved in that process each week. Uh, we sort of scour what we think are our most relevant journals. Um, we all sort of luckily have different uh, areas of interest. I'm pretty interested in pulmonary critical care and general medicine. Um, another one is an oncology fellow. Another one's a cardiology fellow. Someone else is going to GI. So we sort of all have our own little other, other, artic other journals that we're sort of perusing through as well. And then we kind of toss around what we think are the most important, and most relevant. Um, and we have little email arguments about it every week. Like I suppose you guys probably do as well when you're deciding what to talk about. Um, 
Yeah, and we sort of try to find things that we think are you know really relevant to um, residents as far as you know what's going on in the hospital, what's what are, what kind of patients you take care of. Same thing in clinic. What are common issues that we feel like we're talking about a lot and don't know how to manage, um, and what kind of pieces of information uh, might we be able to distill down really quickly and tell somebody in a funny way that they might remember. That's a lot of legwork. I'm impressed that you guys are looking through because I subscription services, your service, and some of the other uh, big yeah. journals that have the services. I I kind of peruse all of those, but uh, looking through the primary literature is I literally tell my residents not to do it, but I think you guys should do it because you're for. <laughs> I, I need you guys to keep doing it to uh, to help me out. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of legwork, but eventually we try to boil it down to something that takes three, four minutes for anyone who subscribes to the newsletter to yeah. read, so which I hope I hope isn't too much for your residents. This too. may be the most important take-home point of the entire night. Medical students, residents, and probably some other attendings too. Like there are people that do this and do this well, so we don't have to. So don't <laughs> don't try to scour a hundred journals yourself every month. There's great people out there doing that for you, and uh, let Armin yeah. do it for you. Right, absolutely. Yeah, let us do it for you. Sign up at uh, www.medicinescope.com. <laughs> there you go. All right, we should move on. Chris, should we get into the, the show? Yeah, speaking of the scope, you know, um, you guys do articles, and that's what we're doing today. So our first article, um, I think Matt's going to tell us about a uh, trial on e-cigarettes. Right. So this is this is an article by Hajek et al., a randomized trial of e-cigarettes versus nic nicotine replacement therapy that appeared in the New England Journal earlier this year in 2019. And we we haven't done a smoking cessation show yet, which we we are in the works to do that. But I thought that this was really uh, an interesting article to talk about. I'm very interested in e-cigarettes and vaping, not because I want to personally use them, just because like I didn't know much about it. And I and People are always asking me, "It does it work? Is it safe? So we'll try to answer some of that here. This article was interesting. They took about 900 patients from the UK National Health Service who were smokers, who had identified themselves as people who wanted to quit, and they randomized them to either... Um, to either nicotine replacement therapy, where they could choose from any of the products like patches or gum, et cetera, or they could get a second generation refillable e-cigarette and they gave them a couple months worth of e-liquid, which is the flavored liquid that has varying concentrations of nicotine that you can put in these cigarettes. And at one year, they followed them out. Well, they, all, the, all patients in both groups got some behavioral counseling weekly, I think, for like the first month. And then they... Um, uh, and then at a year, they looked at who had who had actually abstained, and the way they did that was they measured their carbon monoxide levels, which apparently are detectable for at least 24 hours after you stop smoking. And 18% in the e-cigarette group had stopped smoking versus 10% in the nicotine replacement group. And to give you some numbers of a comparison... It looks like people taking uh, nicotine replacement plus bupropion, there's about a 20% quit rate at a year, or uh, varenicline, if I'm pronouncing that wrong, sorry, uh, that's about 26% um, abstinence rate at 24 weeks. So they, they thought that this rate with the e-cigarettes was a bit comparable. And uh, I'd love to know what Paul Williams thinks about this, since he's our smoking expert. <laughs> <laughs> Usually marijuana, but this is... Sure, right, yeah. <laughs> Expert, please. Um, <laughs> no, I, 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 we were talking a little bit off air about this. And I think we all have kind of similar opinions. It's, I, I think the biggest sort of overarching concern is it seems like you're kind of replacing one habit with another. Um, and I think if we're going to be positive about it, it seems like on balance, e-cigarettes seem to be healthier than tobacco smoking. We don't have any kind of long-term outcome because it's a relatively new phenomenon. So it's the fact that so many people continue to, to vape um, I don't think we know what the sort of long-term effects are, are going to be about that. So I think as an as a modality to quit smoking, tobacco it seems promising, but you may end up sort of substituting it for another long-term problem. Is is kind of my my big takeaway from that. But I think there's a lot of of our sort of health and public health concerns that that we could also probably talk about. I want to see the subgroup analysis because my hypothesis is that of the 16 people who actually stopped smoking everything in the e-cigarette group, I bet all 16 had the popcorn flavor. That'd be gross. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Armin, you were mentioning, uh, the, the, uh, did, did you have a chance to look at any of the, either of the editorials on this one that, that appeared at the same time? Um, I can, I'm just, I'm throwing it to you, but I'm, I'm happy to talk about either one of those. Yeah. So I think, uh, like Paul was hinting at, um, they're probably, e-cigarettes are probably better. We don't have good long-term data. I mean, physiologically, most of the carcinogens come from the tar. We you shouldn't be having a lot of that with with e-cigarettes and vaping, so it probably is better. Um, but I think, you know, one of the other things they pointed out was, you know, what's going to be the overall societal cost benefit of having, of, of vaping, you know, if even if 20% or 18% of people are able to quit smoking, and then 80% of them are still doing this, but then all of these other people are going to be vaping um, at the same time. Um, what's sort of like the net benefit cost of this? Um, and I think that was sort of the main concern from from the editorials. I think that's also going to be sort of a lot of the discussion around vaping moving mm. forward. Right, because from a, a public health standpoint, so this article looks at vaping or use of e-cigarettes as a modality to quit smoking tobacco, Right. But that's not what most people are vaping for. <laughs> so, right. so, and the fact of the matter is, there's actually a nice JAMA article that looked at um, the risk of youth who start with vaping and the risk of actually going on to actually smoke tobacco. And it's pretty high. So, it's the people who yeah. start with vaping end up smoking cigarettes. So, I don't think we should have wild enthusiasm for vaping as an entity. No. Like, I think as a tobacco cessation modality, maybe, but probably not. I mean, I think I'll still probably reach for Verenaclean um, or nicotine replacement therapy first, but it, it's, I think, still probably safer than smoking. The, the big tobacco companies are just loving this too. They're just switching, you know, they're just shifting to that product and people are buying it. It's just, it's yeah. the, like, just, it's gross. And it's like a half a step away from the Kool-Aid man bursting through the wall and something like, it's like, <laughs> tastes like bubble gum and pineapple. Like it is marketed towards children. It's just, it is morally offensive. Yeah. I also could say, you know, if I had a patient who really couldn't get off smoking and this was the only way to get them there, certainly I think it's something to, that I would think about. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the, this article also doesn't really help me think about how you might incorporate um, vaping e-cigarettes into a plan. Whereas, you know, the general way we use nicotine replacement therapy is we give somebody a patch and we give them some other short term, we give them gums, we give them other things. And we try to wean them off of the short term things while they have, while you're increasing doses of the long term things. Whereas we're, we don't really have that all. We just have vaping versus right. other things. And this doesn't really give me a, a framework for how to use that. And at the same time, they didn't include varinicline and bupropion, like you were talking about, that have pretty good track records that are, you know, probably better than, um, than e-cigarettes in this trial, and there's not really any comparison. So we don't really know how it fits in with the rest of our mortalities, how we really do smoking cessation in clinic. Right. And then to piggyback off of that, in, in the one editorial, uh, oh, dear Lord, uh, the e-cigarette to assist with uh, smoking cessation, it pointedly uh, says that the use of e-cigarettes should be monitored by healthcare providers, but how can you even do that? We're not, we're not prescribing it, and it's you, you can't check carbon monoxide levels, so what are you going to do? Just ask the patient you stop smoking i i do think that one of the one of the big things that we should also point out um uncle bob talked about this on his podcast he did a podcast on smoking cessation and they talked about e-cigarettes and the the fda basically threatened these e-cigarette companies like you you need to stop marketing to to adolescents because they had all these like fancy flavors and i guess kids think this is a cool thing to do now so they're they're trying to really heavily restrict where you can get these flavors uh which which kind of are like a gateway for younger people to start using them. So that that was the one of the main things was just saying that this we really should try, have the FDA regulate this. It was really strongly pushing for regulation of of this product because it is potentially a gateway for for young people to start smoking actual combustible cigarettes down the line. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, all you have to do is just look at a picture of e-cigarettes and the bright colors and the flavors. I mean, cherry, orange, double apple, raspberry. I mean, what kind of flavors are those? The, those are not targeted towards adults. Right. And, and yeah, and then there's no, like, there's no uh, off-ramp, as they say. Like, we don't know how we're, we, we've now, now someone has nicotine addiction. That's probably why these people are using it. Uh, 80% are still using it at a year um, in the quick group, so... Oh, nice picture. <laughs> a nice picture there of all the uh, fl fun flavors. Okay, maybe I, I think we've talked this no, one Matt, to you, death. Matt, you got to give us how many hotcakes you think. Oh, ah! yeah, yeah. I, oh, thank you, Chris. <laughs> Chris, I can't thank you enough. 
we, we it's been a while since we've done this and Armin's new to the show. So Armin, I'm going to let you know, uh, this show's called Hot Cakes because uh, way back when we started this a year ago, we were trying to think of a, a of a fun rating system and we just, we set it on hot cakes. So six hot cakes is a full stack. That is the best that you can do. And uh, fact, you have to explain this every single time. Three, it a three hot cakes is a scale. half stack. You can't give half hot cakes. You got to give it's it's all or none. Um, so you, so anywhere from one to six. So I give this about a, uh, four of six, four hot really? cakes, four hot cakes. Wow. Man. That's higher than I thought you would. Give yeah. <laughs> Jeez. That's uh two that's, thirds of a stack. <laughs> Uh, I don't, well, maybe we'll do. and I don't think oh. it's, I don't think it's practice changing. I, I'm not going to be prescribing e-cigarettes at this time. I, I think you can consider it if a patient has failed the other kind of first line FDA approved and recommended therapies, which we talked about. All right. I think we're going to move on to the next subject. Um, now the next article is Paul's other favorite subject on uh, urinary tract infection. Paul? I, <laughs> I have so many favorite subjects and I had no idea. <laughs> This is an article from uh, Garby et al. and BMJ, um, Antibiotic Management of UTIs and Elderly Patients. Um, and it, it came out relatively recently, and I bring this up, the reason I was interested in this um, is because we actually did a relatively recent Peabody Award-winning show with Dr. Fanukin, um, looking at sort of treatment of UTIs with air quotes and asymptomatic bacteria and sort of what constitutes a urinary tract infection and what are actually UTI symptoms. Um, generated a, a lot of conversation, a lot of buzz. Some of it actually a little bit critical of, of our of our takes and approach, which I kind of took to heart. And so I was sort of looking at a way, uh, looking at sort of more data and, and, and thinking more critically about how we treat possible urinary tract infections, again, with the quote hands. So this article, um, and then my other <laughs> faithful listeners will also know I tend to pick articles that then I find way too dense and uh, mathematically <laughs> complex to fully understand. And this, this goes with this as well. But basically, this is an article that, the study that, that it was a, a retrospective review, and basically what they did is they actually abstracted a bunch of medical records from a database. So they have this database in England called the Clinical Practice Research Data Link, and a lot of primary care centers are linked to this, as are a lot of hospitals. And what they did is they looked at patients who were diagnosed with urinary tract infection. We can talk about how that was actually done. Um, and these patients had to be 65 years of age or older, and they had to be presenting after being seen by their general practitioner for, I think, something like a year, just so that you could sort of capture all their comorbidities. And then what they looked at is this sort of index diagnosis of urinary tract infection. Um, and then they further looked at whether or not, once this diagnosis was made, whether or not the patients were treated with immediate antibiotics, with delayed antibiotics, meaning uh, within a week, or not treated with antibiotics at all, and then looked at outcomes. And I, I'm going to ask you guys and beg you guys to jump in if I'm getting sort of the facts wrong. And then the outcomes that they looked like specifically were whether or not these patients developed bloodstream infections or whether or not they died were sort of the, the, the main outcomes that they looked at. And so bottom line, I'm going to cut to the chase, then we can sort of talk about the statistical massage and sort of the, the fine details, is that their takeaway point was that patients – who had deferred antibiotic treatment or were not treated with antibiotics for their UTI had higher all-cause mortality and a higher rate of bloodstream infections than patients who were treated immediately for their diagnosed urinary tract infections. And these findings were especially pronounced in older patients, so male patients over the age of 85 uh, from lower socioeconomic statuses. And so their, their takeaway from their study was that these are the patients that we should be extra aggressive in terms of prescribing antibiotic therapy for urinary tract infections. Um, Wado, did I get the, the major points right before we get into it? Yeah, absolutely. So I, on, on the, the surface of it, kind of alarming because <laughs> we had just, you know, because, you know, I think our, we're internationally listened to and we told everyone to not treat any urinary tract infections to have this article come out was fairly damning. Um, and so, you know, the things that we discussed with Dr. Fanukin is that it's there's not a, there had not been to point, this point a whole lot of good evidence that urinary tract infections progress necessarily to bacteremia or to sort of rip raging infections in the absence of treatment. Like it's just not been definitively proven. And this article would probably make the argument more towards towards that fact that actually if you don't treat bad things can happen, particularly in older patients, right? Yeah. Yeah, there was the one. There was the one article in younger patients that showed maybe there was an increased risk of pyelonephritis, which he he did mention. He admitted that, but said largely, you know, his point was that urinary tract infections have been around for so long and antibiotics have not, and 
he thought he didn't buy that uh, that that they would be that they were causing all these bloodstream infections, pyelonephritis, et cetera. And but the main the main point of that article, and we we got banged up a little bit, Paul, on that article on that episode because uh, people said that thought that we were downplaying too much the actual pain and morbidity that goes along with urinary tract infection. So we did we did uh, address that on the website and everything. So that that was that was a bit misconstrued. We did not mean to imply that. And so in this case, I think the the, the difference of what we were talking about there is um, is a lot of asymptomatic bacteria bacteria and a lot of delirium just gets automatically blamed on UTI in patients who have no UTI symptoms. They just send a urine because the patient's acting a little funny. And so in those older adults, that's not really who we're talking about in this study. The, okay, so we're still. I'm still saying that if someone's asymptomatic and you discover asymptomatic bacteria, I I do not think you need to treat that um, unless they have some other infection uh, that that person probably does not need antibiotics. But this study specifically looked at people at their general practitioner in the UK who uh, were diagnosed with a UTI, and how they diagnosed it is one of the confusing parts of this right. study. Absolutely. Because we were we're looking at the supplementary supplementary material and it looks like they just sort of guessed like what diagnosis codes a physician might put in to the computer if they thought their patient had a UTI and then they looked were antibiotics prescribed at that visit or not or were they prescribed within 7 days of that visit? On, on a revisit by the patient, which was considered delayed antibiotics, people who got visit antibiotics at the same exact visit were immediate antibiotics. And uh, so that, that kind of creates a little confusion. But here, this the point of this study and the reason we wanted to do it is saying, this is saying that if you have elderly folks who could present to you with UTI symptoms uh, in this observational trial, they can't prove causality, but it seems like there may be increased risk for bloodstream infections and all-cause mortality. And so that did did shake me a bit. And even uh, the great Paul Sachs, who is a <laughs> right. friend of the show, uh, he wrote, and I'll quote him, this is from the uh, Physician's First Watch, this study describes the other side of the coin for clinicians wish- wishing to avoid overtreating asymptomatic bacteria in the elderly, which that it, which is that the undertreatment of symptomatic infection may have serious complications. Sym- in, in quote, he said symptomatic infection may have serious complications. The practical difficulty of assessing symptoms of UTI, especially in those with cognitive decline, remains a substantial challenge. And that's why this is a, you know, that's a tricky thing. Um, so I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with that. You know, yeah. if you have a patient who can't tell you if they're acting wacky, uh, if they can't tell you if they have urinary tract symptoms, I, I don't know what to do there. Yeah. I like to, if I could just make two points. So the first is I think that some of the, the concerns that were voiced by our listeners are hundred percent valid, by the way. So sort of the three of us breezily talking about non-treatment of UTIs, I could see how that would be, um, how that would sort of raise some hackles, completely understood and taken to heart. I the the other point is I, you know, we've all we have primary care experience. I'm not sure how many patients you've had over the age of 85 who come to you and tell you, doctor, I have a urinary tract infection. It burns when I urinate. Um, this is similar to prior urinary tract infections, and there's nothing else going on. Like that is actually it would be a fairly uncommon presentation to me. I think you normally check your analysis if you just kind of don't know what's going on. And I so right. so you know whether or not what the diagnosis code that was abstracted, I'm not sure is a, an accurate reflection of the actual office experience. And so this quote diagnosis of UTI, I don't know was a slam dunk home run as just like a, the UK equivalent of ICD-10 code would be. So I, I think that kind of muddies the water and I think that's one of the shortcomings of any kind of observational study like this. And I'm sorry Stuart, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I was just going to say, uh, you were saying something about the association with age and death before we uh, started recording. I, and I thought it was a, it was a poignant uh, point that you had that, <laughs> that uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very obvious that the highest mortality was seen in the older patients, especially those with a diagnosis of UTI, which kind of is, it's, it's just a dumb moment. But there's a, a, a few other spurious correlations here, um, one of which, if you were diagnosed with a UTI after, the, after 2012, you're more likely to die. I mean, that's just strange. <laughs> I think that's along the lines of uh, what was the one that Tony told us on? <laughs> you know, like Is it aspirin and uh, your uh, your zodiac sign. Yes, yeah, there you that go. one. Good that one. one. Yeah. Yeah. So I I, I think uh, you've you've got to read this study with a grain of salt. 
Um, especially when you look through the supplementary material, you're, you're talking what 93 pages of, of abstracted uh, codes that help to delineate the uh, what the the all cause. I don't know. It, I, I don't understand how UK does this. The the Charleston comorbidity index, the CCI. Yeah, I I I, 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 I have a hard time understanding this trial. I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, I well, think so the thing that we want to be able to take away from it, right, is who do you treat and who do you not treat? That's sort of the question. Yeah. Um, and we're trying to avoid the complications of antibiotics and be good antibiotic stewards. Um, and what we get from this trial is that there's some increased mortality in bacteri bacter bacteremia in these older patients. But as far as what the symptoms were, what the urinalysis looked like, you know, how much how much uh, was growing in culture, sort of all the, all the other picture we sort of kind of lose. And I don't really know from this trial who I should be treating, who I shouldn't be treating. Right. Yeah. It doesn't really help. The editorialist from the BMJ, uh, rec he referenced that there are nice guidelines, like the, the UK guidelines were just updated recently. And for women with just cystitis and or, or men with just cystitis, they recommended treating women for three days with either trim sulfa or nitrofurantoin or one dose of phosphomycin. And for men, they recommend trim sulfa or, um, or nitrofurantoin for seven days for just cystitis uncomplicated. And I think they're using the definition of complicated as like they have systemic symptoms of illness, tachycardia, like sort of sepsis physiology, things like that. Um, that's, that's the same, the up to date is now kind of using that the, the, right. the writer Houdin is now using that as the definition of a complicated UTI. Uh, someone that's actually systemically ill from the urinary tract infection, and those people can be treated longer. But the, the editorialist is saying, treat for you know, treat with appropriate antibiotics for the shortest amount of time. That's the best thing you can do um, for patients when they actually need antibiotics. Well, it's there's a paragraph that kind of blew me away. And I, I, so, patients older than 85 years living in deprived area with a high Charleston comorbidity index score were mainly managed using either deferred antibiotics or no antibiotics whereas patients aged between 65 and 74 were mainly prescribed immediate antibiotics. So the older and more complicated you were, the less likely you were to be treated with immediate antibiotics. And so I think that just, <laughs> I think that speaks to, it's just, it's not a straightforward diagnosis in this particular patient population. So the older, and more complicated you get, the less clear that you're dealing with a, an acute cystitis and more you're dealing with something seems weird here. So I better check some stuff and see what's going on. And I, I so I, I think we've already made this point, but I'm not sure you can draw a straight line between uh, again, whatever the UTI diagnosis that was coded for and the actual patient presentation. So, Paul, does that mean that you're giving this a full stack? <laughs> I'm giving this a maple flavored vape pen, whatever that amounts to. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's time for our guest to do his article, and um, I'm interested to see what Armin has to say. Yeah, so the article I uh, bring up is uh, Velasquez et al. Um, angiotensin neprilysin inhibition in acute decompensated heart failure, or in the fancy branding of cardiology trials, Pioneer HF. Um, in the uh, New England <laughs> Journal uh, in February 2019. Um, so, so this trial is is about this new drug, um, uh, Secubitril valsartan, ARNI, uh, which is angiotensin neprilysin angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor. Um, and so kind of some background here, um, there's been really very few big advances in the treatment of, of uh, outpatient heart failure in a pretty long time. Um, ACE inhibitors, original trial tests were in the 80s, beta blockers, um, mineral to corticoid receptors in the 90s, uh, ARBs in the early 2000s, isosorbide hydral in 2004, 2005. So really it's been a long time since a new drug came into play for how we manage uh, heart, systolic heart failure. Um, and so in 2014, we had the Paradigm Heart Failure Trial, which is a big trial, over 8,000 patients, um, looking at patients that were stable, uh, outpatient, um, you know, really well maximized on current recommendation, on recommendations of the time. Um, and they looked at a primary composite outcome of cardiovascular death and CHF hospitalizations. And this trial was actually stopped early at 27 months for benefit of their primary endpoint being 21.8% versus 26.5%, and also was, had significant decrease um, on, on the secondary endpoints of cardiovascular mortality and CHF hospitalizations. So a question remains from that trial, um, 
you know, can you start this for people that are inpatient in acute in acute decompensation? Um, and really, it hasn't been uh, very well accepted. A lot of clinical inertia, people aren't using it a lot. A lot of that is maybe clinician comfort, comfort with it. Um, also, still not covered by a lot of insurance, which is something I run into a lot, at least. Um, and then another uh, criticism in this trial was that, is this really representative patient group of who we have that has heart failure? Only 5% of the patients in that trial were black. Um, sort of not necessarily representative of most of the patients, a lot of the patients that we treat. So this recent trial, the Pioneer Heart Failure Trial, um, 880 patients, and these people were they were admitted with acute decompensated heart failure. Um, and while they're in the hospital, um, once they're st clinically stabilized, not hypotensive, off inotropes, they're randomized to either receive this Secubitril, Valsartan, Versa, and ACE inhibitor. They use Enalapril 10 BID um, is what they would titrate up to. And they interestingly use this outcome, which we can uh, discuss, of uh, the ProBNP at four and eight weeks was their main clinical endpoint. Um, but I think what they're hoping people would pay attention to were some safety outcomes, um, such as hyperkalemia, AKI, uh, symptomatic hypotension, angioedema, um, which which, according to their analysis, at least, were not significantly different between the two um, arms of the study. Um, they did find that there was a reduced CHF hospitalization between the two, 8% versus 14%. Um, and they had this giant composite index of uh, serious events, a death, readmission, LVAD, transplant, which was significantly different between the two arms as well. So kind of the question is, is how is, is this going to change practice um, you know, are people going to take this as evidence that you can start this acutely? Is this better evidence that this is better than uh, what we do currently is sort of the question and how we think people are going to interpret it. I just want to talk about a little bit of the background of the the BNP or N NT pro BNP stuff. So this was because the heart fail failure guidelines were updated in 2017 and they recommended more checking this for prognosis, not for acute therapy. So you could check it on a hospital admission for prognosis. You could check it on discharge for prognosis or just in patients like you think are at risk for heart failure or, or outpatients. There's a whole bunch of, but it was always for prognosis. And it seems to be a marker of like, of, of a poorer prognosis or maybe more severe disease not necessarily more severe disease, just a poor prognosis. And it, it just, it was weird that it's been studied in randomized controlled trials. And those trials show that by, by targeting this specifically, they didn't really see any benefit. So I, I just thought it was weird that they chose this as their clinical endpoint for this when heart failure readmissions or mortality w seems like that would be more of a, you know, clear, like more of something to go after. Cause that's more, we're more used to seeing that as an endpoint. You think maybe they did that because it was not like none of the significant clinical events, unless they took a composite of death, rehospitalization re and LVAD was a uh, clinically or statistically significant. I, it almost looks like they're trying to massage the data a little bit and say, well, this is statistically significant, but statistical significance is not clinical significance make. Right. These are both, you know, trials that are sponsored by uh, by the pharma industry, and this trial was, you know, a tenth the size of the original trial. I think they didn't want to sponsor another large trial that really was going to be powered for those clinical endpoints that, you know, would be more interesting and more interesting to us clinically, um, and the safety endpoints, which I think was what really people were, are really going to look at from this. There's also not not a lot of money in, you know, a five days of treatment versus chronic outpatient treatment, so. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the reason why they wanted to do that is that there's certainly a lot of data that people are not comfortable starting new drugs in the outpatient setting, mm. um, and that they think maybe if people feel comfortable from this trial starting um, starting an ARNI on patients when they're inpatient, they're more likely to continue it outpatient. That makes sense, um, and that's probably a little bit of the at least in the back in the background of of why the pharma industry was interested in sponsoring this trial. If, if they show that it's safe to do here, more people will do it, and then maybe more people will continue this in the outpatient Got setting. It. That, that actually kind of makes that sense. That is genius and devious. Yeah. I am so impressed. You are you going into pharma? That is brilliant. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm actually going to be branding uh, cardiology trial names as sort of my. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's where the money's at. Got Leib HF. Got Leib HF. Got Leib AF. Actually. <laughs> I I guess one one practical question I have for most people, and I think the majority of us on. the on the podcast right now, have do our fair share of inpatient. I mean, like I have a lot of patients I admit for um, 
heart failure. And a lot of times I'll hold their ACE inhibitor because you know, they have renal function issues when they first get in. And when I discharge them, I'm no, usually still not completely ready to start just like a regular ACE inhibitor. And I'll often leave it to a PCP to follow up, like to make sure the renal function is completely normalized. And I don't normally... I don't always keep patients completely until their renal function is completely back to normal. I continue to diurese them and so forth. So I don't know what's everyone else's like practical clinical experience in this. Does everyone make sure that they leave on ACE inhibitor already? That's such a great question. I I have the same question more about the the initiation, the timing of the initiation, because so many patients come in with cardiorenal syndrome or, you know, they have this elevation crad and eventually improves once you diurese them well enough. But yeah, for sure, I'm not just blasting away with ARBs or ACEs until they, they're created and sort of leveled out. At least that's my own personal practice. I can't tell you how evidence-based that is. But I wonder how in this trial they decided sort of when to pull the trigger on either the ACE or the, or the, the SNR, or the Secubitril. Yeah, and, and I, I just put some text in there for you, basically saying that because of the way that they ran the trial, it actually prolonged the length of stay. The average length of stay was sometime, somewhere between five and six days for a heart failure exacerbation. And, that, and that, that's a little bit longer than the typical patients that I admit to the hospital. I wonder if there's any association with any clinical endpoint that would be interesting to us, like uh, you know, uh, adverse events in, in hospital mortality, things that are otherwise associated with prolonged length of stay. Uh, one of the things we didn't point out when we talked about Paradigm HF on a on a prior show is that you do need a 36 hour washout for if someone's been on an ACE or an R before starting an ARNI, and uh, and you do also have to think about does this person have risk of angioedema when you're starting one of these medications. Um, so that that could potentially be a limitation if you're trying to switch someone over in the hospital. You might have to have that waiting period. And then the other thing is these medications in the initial trial, they had this really long, complicated run-in phase where they made sure people could tolerate really high doses of ACEs and ARBs so that they didn't bottom out their blood pressures. And I think for patients with systolic heart failure, their blood pressures tend to be on the lower side a lot of the times to begin with. So I think that's a major limitation to using these drugs in addition to so- cost and the other things. Um, that, that you would run into. So going around the room, kind of speaking back to what Armand was saying, what, what do you guys think? Would you start this in the hospital or would you wait? Like, w- w- would you keep them in the hospital in a few extra days to start this or would you just wait to follow up as an outpatient or have the cardiologist start it? It's, I think it's whatever's what best for the patient. Like, I don't, I don't know that you would have to wait, keep them in the hospital just to start this medication if you knew they had follow up and they're gonna, they can, it can be started as an outpatient. Yeah, so you're not gonna keep them in the hospital, right? Y- yeah, I would not. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think that's one of the things they're hoping to make people feel more comfortable with with this trial, was saying that there wasn't, uh, you know, a big difference in, you know, AKI and hyperkalemia and these things and symptomatic hypotension, um, but there's this pretty wide. Uh, confidence intervals, you know, up to, uh, it was like, you know, 0.4 to 1.89 for hyperkalemia, up to 1.64 for symptomatic hypotension, up to 1.28 for AKI. So, you know, um, I, I I think that some people might want to, might think they need to be more careful with it. Um, but, but I think in general, people aren't going to want to keep people in the hospital for five days to start a new drug. So <laughs> I don't know how people are going to interpret this. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. I, I haven't seen it used yet in clinical practice, but I, I just have a feeling it will, I, I think regardless of this, it'll start to slowly trickle in. Uh, you know, if, if people can get their hands on it, I think people will start to use it because it's new and it seems, to, it seems to have at least some data that it works, regardless of how skeptical we are of, you know, the, the source of that. It's a new toy. I 100% agree. It's a new toy. Toy. We've got this great trial name that just rolls right off the tongue. So, like, I think there's going to be wild enthusiasm for starting it while in patients, since we have data to support the safety. And then, I think Armin's right that that way it'll carry forward in the outpatient until you know the insurance runs out, or and then we're fighting prior authorizations in primary care offices. See, at, at my uh, at my my branch of Kashuk, um hospitals. Um, we do have like this heart, heart failure pathway where patients on discharge are then um, have a pathway into our heart failure clinic. And actually, we've I've had quite a few patients that were started on on Arnie's at, during that time. So I mean, when they leave the hospital, they have a, a quick follow up with a heart failure doctor, and then they're started at that time. And it seems to make more sense from my standpoint for that. 
I will say one thing from this trial, I will not be targeting BNP levels or NT pro BNP levels for my heart failure patients uh, based on based on this trial. This trial doesn't add any evidence that we should be doing that. And the most recent trial before this I've heard showed that that wasn't really beneficial. You, you know, one thing that we didn't talk about, and I, I don't want to like open up a can of worms, was the rehospitalization rate. So historically in the United States, rehospitalization rate for heart failure is just north of 20%, except for, and we recently did a study at our branch of Cash Lake, which found that even if you had a follow up within 30 days of discharge, that alone decreases your rehospitalization rate down to between 13 and 14%. And that's actually the percentage rate that you see with uh, the an Analopril group. So I think one thing it's important to push on this is actually just ensuring close outpatient follow-up. Armin, how many hotcakes are you giving this one? Um, I'd like to give it um, four Armin, hotcakes. you don't have to do this. You don't <laughs> I would have like to do this. To, now, I would like to. I've been looking forward to doing this for a while. So uh, I would I would like to give it four hotcakes. Um, I think that you know the, the primary endpoint is something that people aren't really going to look at from this. So maybe you can think that's a little manufactured. But I mean, I think the drug has good data that it's probably better than a lot of our standard medicines right now. Um, and I think you know, possibly this can help convince some more people to start um, using it for patients that they think it's appropriate for. So, um, yeah, I think I give it, I give it, I give it four hotcakes. Excellent. I like it. You can come back anytime if you keep using hotcakes. So Armin, I'd like to, um, now, now that we've talked about these couple articles, I thought maybe you could give us some of your great takeaways from maybe the articles that we talked about today. Oh, like my, my takeaways from them? Yeah. Your takeaways. Um, I'd love to hear them. <laughs> okay, so from, from each article. So um, my takeaway from the ARNI trial is that it has some better data for starting in the acute decompensated heart failure setting, um, something that I will think about now with my patients in the hospital, if their insurance will cover it, if I think they're a good candidate for it, something we can think about starting while they're still in the hospital. Um, from this UTI trial, uh, well, not trial, but UTI study, um, I think that, you know, I think it's, reinforces that we need to be careful and who we uh, don't give medicines for UTIs for. I think that most people, if they really think a uh, older patients over 75, 85 has a UTI in our mind, I think most people probably are still going to treat it. So I don't know how much it's going to change what I do, but um, I think after listening to your guys, uh, your guys podcast from uh, a couple weeks back, um, it certainly gives me the, the other side of the coin. So something to think about. Um, for sure. And um, with uh, with our, our other our other trial, this vaping trial, vaping study, I think it's it's uh, it's an interesting study that was done. I don't think like you guys said, I'm going to start prescribing vape pens. Um, and I think I might even think about using vape pen as the less than one hot cake, which is, I think, what Paul used it for. Um, <laughs> sorry, is, it the, is it the popcorn vape pen? Yeah, is the bottom popcorn. of the bottom of the hot cakes pile? Um, but I think it's something something to think about that that you know, if you really, if everything else fails, you really think somebody can't can't get off of smoking cigarettes. Um, is there some role for harm reduction with this? Maybe, um, and maybe that'll stay in the back of my mind. Uh, worst case scenario for people. Well done. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, this is a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I really, really am, uh, really appreciate you guys having us on. Um, yeah, and I hope maybe we can uh, do this again sometime in the future. Definitely. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. Just want to let that one sit for a let little bit. Sit. Yeah. <laughs> Get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast. Then sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. That's right. We're committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes or contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. Special thanks to our producers for this episode, Chris the Chu Man Chu and Sarah Phoebe Roberts, and to our social media team, Hannah R. Abrams on Twitter, Beth Garb Scarvatelli on Instagram, and Chris the Chu Man Chu a second time on Facebook. Until next time, I'm Stuart Kent Brigham. I'm Christopher Chu. The Chu Man Chu. I'm <laughs> Stuart, this was a an absolute pleasure <laughs> hearing you read that tonight. <laughs> I've been Matthew Frank Watto. And I remain Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Paul. Goodbye.
big fan of your guys' show, so I really appreciate you uh, having me as a resident um, compared to your usual fare of very esteemed uh, attendings and people high up involved. So thank you so much for including me with your show. I think Paul's the only one that's esteemed. No, Paul, I think Paul he's is a referring national to treasure. Not host, we, we should remind the audience to uh, end all <laughs> yeah. their tweets with Paul Williams is a national treasure or just refer to him as, as a national treasure on a regular basis. They'll, they'll know who you mean. Yeah. <laughs>